So I may need to uninstall and then reinstall my Facebook uh, because every time I go live in the last two weeks, it's constantly like trying to reconnect, trying to reconnect and it's very distracting and I love my Facebook platform and I've fully enjoyed going live and I think I need to do more lives where I read comments, engage with people, answer questions. I think that would add a lot of value. I know I haven't done that on YouTube in a while and maybe I'll, I'll go to doing that as well. Instagram live, probably. I think I need to spend some time doing Instagram live so I'm just engaging with my audience, answering questions that people would like me to answer in real time and then take it from there. So I was on Facebook just recently and I wanted to speak about two points. The first one being humans versus animals. The second one being illegal foreigners, illegal immigrants, undocumented foreigners, undocumented Im immigrants. Unfortunately, I had to cut the video short because it kept buffering and it was very frustrating and killing my momentum. So I'm going to make this video, I'm going to compress it and then I'm going to upload it on Facebook and then upload it on YouTube as well. One of my favorite YouTube videos, if not my favorite YouTube videos, is by Yuval Noah Harari, an Israeli man who wrote the book Sapiens. I haven't read the book, to be fully honest, um, but it documents the history of human beings and humankind and human progression. The two biggest takeouts for me in that TED talk by Yuval is that he says the reason human beings run the world and dominate other animals is because human beings live in a dual reality. We live in two realities. The first one being the objective reality, the stuff that we see, the mountains, the rivers, the rocks, other human beings, other animals, trees, etc. And then human beings have created a fictional reality. Things like the law, things like money, things like religion and gods. You know, and he says because of this fictional reality, we've been able to, as human beings, collaborate and cooperate with each other in organized structures. Not only in the present, but with past people that existed. Whereas other animals cannot do that. Chimpanzees, lions, elephants, even bees. They don't have books that they've written. Um, they can't collaborate and say, oh, you know, back in 1952, when our great, great, great grandfather, the, this bee, did, decided to create new types of beehives, this is what happened. You know, so for that reason, unfortunately, uh, bees and other animals cannot collaborate. And that's why human beings dominate them. Because on a one-on-one, -on -one, when you look at us versus an elephant, us versus a chimpanzee, us versus a lion, one-on-one -on -one as a human being, on your own, you know, you will lose completely. Those animals will outlive you, they will kill you, they will out-survive you. However, because of human collaboration, the idea that I can take a spear and stab an animal, I didn't invent the spear, I didn't find a way to extract iron ore and create steel and make this weapon. I didn't come up with that. There was a human being somewhere, there were human beings somewhere that came up with those ideas and they've been passed on through the generations for us to then be able to use today. So he speaks about collaboration as a big thing. I just wanted to emphasize, because I've spoken about this before, and it's a concept I'll speak about for a while, because it's fundamentally important to me. Some of the differentiators for me, because I gave you the two, uh, the one by Yuval, the fact that human beings live in a dual reality. For me, I note it down as human beings have language, we have fictional stories, we have uh, curiosity, we have imagination, and we have an ability to collaborate. For me, those are very important. What you do with language is that with language, unlike other animals, I can speak to someone that I've never met before. Someone from China, someone from Europe, someone from America, I can speak to them. And if they understand this language I'm speaking, if we have a, similar, a common language, whether it's English, Mandarin, Spanish, whatever. I can teach them things that they didn't know before that will help them advance their lives. I can tell them that lion that's coming, it actually has no teeth, don't worry. And because they understand language, they can then realize this is a harmless animal. Or I can train them to learn how to manage certain animals. So that's language. The fictional story part is money, it's religion, gods. It's you telling someone, if you don't behave, God will punish you. If you don't behave, the law will have you arrested. For example, you will be fined. If you want to work, you will be paid this much. These are concepts that other animals don't have. They don't have 
fictional stories where other lions are telling other lions, you're not going to go to heaven. Or chimpanzees are telling other chimps, oh, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to go to prison. For example, They don't have that like we do. Those are fictional stories which we've all bought into. You take the fictional stories, you tell them through books, through music, through um, movies, through TV series, whatever. You tell these fictional stories through language. And then with the language, with the fictional stories, imagination. Because a child has to imagine what does the devil look like? What is the boogeyman? What is the idea of jail? So that when you threaten them, they have an idea. Of course, today we can get like images. There's pictures, there's drawings. There were sculptures back in the day. There were paintings that would be like, this is what Satan looks like. This is what God looks like. Zeus, for example. This is what Jesus Christ looked like. So there's a lot of uh, tangible examples of things that we're meant to fear. Video, of course. But imagination is important because you have to imagine yourself suffering, burning in hell, as an example. You have to imagine yourself in heaven with God and the angels and the angels with the wings. You have to imagine that realistically in your head. The other thing for me importantly is curiosity. I know other animals are curious, of course, but our curiosity as human beings seem to go beyond. Because to me at least, if chimpanzees were as curious as human beings, they would go out there and begin picking up language on their own. Chimpanzees would mimic and copy a, a house that is built by a human. They would look at a weapon and be like, I want to learn how to make this thing. They would see human beings digging and mining or farming and they would start digging holes and planting it. So I don't think animals are as curious as human beings. We have a desire to constantly know more. Sometimes we're curious about the future. Sometimes we're curious about the past. We're like, let's look into the past and try and figure out what lessons can we learn from the past that we can use today to advance ourselves. We even study animals. I don't think animals study us as a species, but we study them. When you look at the airplanes we've designed to mimic birds, when you look at some of the ships we've designed that mimic some of the animals, submarines that mimic some of the animals that are in the oceans, for example, we study nature a lot in our infrastructure, in our building, in our trains, in our cars, etc. So... The curiosity aspect is very important. And then the last one for me, which allows human beings to actually dominate animals as a whole, is collaboration. You can speak a language. You can come up with fictional stories. You can be, have a curious mind and want to know more. You can have an amazing imagination. But if you're alone just with that, you cannot do anything special. You need to collaborate with other human beings. And when you collaborate with other human beings, you can start collaborating with animals. Like taking a cow and making it plow your fields. Taking a donkey and putting a load on its back so that it can transport stuff for you. You collaborate, but firstly with human beings. Because if I have language and a story, I can tell someone, run to the store and go fetch this while I do something else. And they do that and I do this. And then we come together and we create something special. We do it in sports. We do it in war. We do it in how we exchange and trade money. We do it in building amazing infrastructures. The pyramids is an example, the Eiffel Tower, you know, the Statue of Liberty, the Chrysler Building. That's all through collaboration. The Great Wall of China, as an example, that requires collaboration. And the cool thing about human beings is with language, we've been able to document it in a book format. I can be born in 2022. And after I've learned language, how to read, how to imagine, how to be curious, I can go and read a book that was written in 1658 by some white man in Canada that I've never met and will never meet and don't care about. But I can take what that person left in that book and apply, whether it's making energy, electricity, whether it's baking a cake, whether it's building some type of bridge, etc. And I can collaborate with other people who have invented or sell hammers, uh, drilling tools, uh, invented electricity so that I can use them. People that have come up with the concept of turning coal or the sun into power. You collaborate I'm here today on a video. I'm using a Samsung phone. Samsung family, uh, or the family in uh, that created Samsung in South Korea. They made the phone and they also st uh, borrowed and learned this idea from whoever invented the cell phone. Then people came up with the internet. And with the internet, I can send this to people around the world in video format for people that came up with video cameras. I'm connected to electricity, which, which was apparently... 
um, invented by Thomas Edison and some of those people. You know, so this is collaboration. And I'm speaking an English that I didn't manufacture. I'm wearing clothing. I never, man, I never invented the jersey or this black whatever. This is me collaborating with people now, people in the past, ideas and ideologies that have been built layer upon layer to be able to deliver this to you. And you, because you've learned language and an understanding, can now understand me and take what I'm teaching you and go and apply it somewhere else. And I think that's fundamentally beautiful. When we divide each other on race, gender, nationality, unfortunately, we lose the ability to collaborate because it becomes us versus them. And you aren't able to learn from these people. Even on the African continent, as much as colonizers came here and bullied their way in, because of them, we have some of these advancements. We hadn't invented yet. That they had picked up across all their travels around the world. They brought them here. And we were able to use those things to build. That's why a lot of us don't want to go back to living in the villages, living a subsistence rural life, fetching water from the river, fetching firewood. Because we're like, no, but at the flick of a switch, I get electricity. At the flick of a switch, I can call someone on a cell phone using mobile data or Wi-Fi. So we're happy to collaborate with people that have traveled. Not just Europeans, but Asians as well and other people from elsewhere. Speaking about division, my second point was illegal foreigners and illegal uh, immigrants. I've made a few videos this year in particular because Operation Tudula and Tantra Lux have been trending for a while. Before that, and today on the Virtual Mkuku with myself and DJ Smoo, uh, you can go to the Virtual Mkuku channel on YouTube. Please subscribe. Please click the notification bell as well. We did an interview with Herman Mashaba, uh, who is the founder of Black Like Me, a beauty uh, product company. Herman Mashaba at some point was the mayor of Johannesburg under the Democratic Alliance. And he pushed hard with this illegal foreigner story, making sure that buildings that had been hijacked by illegal foreigners were cleaned out, etc. That caught flame as an election tool because black people were very impressed. The black masses in South Africa were very impressed with that work. Gaten McKenzie has said the same under his political party, the Patriotic Alliance, and he's echoing it again now that he's the mayor in the central Karoo. And then obviously, our Operation Tutula and Abu Antlantalax, who's uh, one of the members there, along with being the founder of Soweto Youth Parliament, they've been pushing hard that we need to fix this, this issue of illegal foreigners. Afri Forum has come on as well, speaking about the borders and how they're non-existent out there. So it's been a trending topic. So I've made a couple of videos giving my views around the stuff. Different, difficult, conflicting, contrasting, dynamic views because it's a multi-layered uh, topic. Speak about borders, speaking about uh, white people that came here as colonizers and why are they not deemed illegal foreigners, etc. Arun Mutualedi of the ANC, who is the Minister of Home Affairs, is also trying to push now um, I know with the Zimbabwean exemption permit, which I made a video about, with 180,000 Zimbabweans who are potentially going to be deported come the end of this year, unless if they um, find new permits, because that was a special permit, and also other illegal foreigners that are a topic of contention. I wrote a piece this morning. I'm going to post it on my Facebook. I posted it in my WhatsApp group, which I'm probably going to dismantle very soon because I want to focus on building Something like Afri Forum, but building it around myself and my religion of penalism, where I'm the central force, but I have a team that is doing good work on the ground, in particular for penalists. So copying the Afri Forum model of saying, here we have a group, maybe a non-profit organization, you're going to, with a debit order, send 100 rand, 200 rand a month, and then we're going to collect that money, and then we're going to use it to uplift, similar to the Muslims in South Africa, similar to the Jews in South Africa, and similar to the white Afrikaners, especially the ones that set up the Bruder Pond, to see if we can uplift penalists. Penalists are not black people. We are a non-racialist group. It's for people that are like-minded. So I'm going to probably collapse my WhatsApp group. But the bottom line that I was trying to say is I posted this piece that I wrote in that WhatsApp group. I'm going to post it on Facebook as well. And I might break it into pieces for Twitter. In the piece I was saying, and I'm going to try and remember, the concept of foreigners, the concept of legal and illegal foreigners is something that arrived with colonizers when they got here. I'll speak from a South African perspective. 
when they got here, arguably in 1652, Jan van Riebeek and the boys, they decided to then fight and eventually conquer and colonize, particularly with the British, but also with uh, the Dutch and then some French and some German people as well. They colonized this country and the black indigenous people of this country. And after colonizing this country, they brought their systems from Europe. Those systems included the schooling system. They included the media of sorts, including music and movies. They included the legal system. And with that, they came up with this concept of you are a South African citizen. And they demarcated borders around this country. And they became, in effect, the first citizens officially, according to the way they designed it, of this country. That's why they're not illegal. Because before them, Africans didn't have, or at least in the South African context, Africans didn't have the system that they had. So Africans couldn't say, you are a foreigner. That's a, co a, a colonial concept. And black people in by and large, whether it's through conquest, bullying, the education system, media, have bought into it. That's why it's the same black people today that are fighting. The sad thing is the colonizers did that for their own purposes because they wanted to exploit the land, the minerals, and even the labor of this country. And today, obviously, black people have bought into that, not just in South Africa, but across the African continent and everywhere else in the world. It was for their agenda, and sadly, their agenda has been carried through for a minority of elite, which today includes black people, a chunk of them being ANC leadership, who have gotten BEE shares, other black people who middle class, rich, whether through hard work, having a great job, being doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, actuaries, whatever. Um, Indians, of course, some Chinese and other Eastern Asian people that are here. And even some of um, the foreigners that are here from the African continent and from Asia and other places, they have become an elite minority and they are comfortable with this concept of borders and this concept of illegal foreigners because it doesn't serve their agenda. Hypocritically, unfortunately, some of these minority people also exploit a lot of illegal foreigners because they can't get the protection of our labor laws. So they pay below minimum wage to maximize profits. So what I've decided and where I stand today, and look, my thoughts might change over time. I don't want to fight for their agenda because it's not my agenda. I don't want to fight for government. I'm not a government employee. I'm not a politician. I don't get paid to protect the borders. I don't get paid to deport foreigners who are called illegal because of a colonial system. And weirdly, I'm based in Johannesburg. Mbabane, the capital of Eswatini, is close. Maseru, the capital of Lesotho, is close. Khaburone, the capital of Botswana, is close. Compared to a Port Elizabeth, a Kabecha, compared to an East London, a Mont, compared to Cape Town, a Kaba, compared to Durban, a Tewini, those places are much further than the places I've told you about. And yet those people see themselves as locals and those other people are deemed foreigners. On top of that, local, for local people who are criminals, who add no value, who steal from other people, who commit crimes, who pay no tax. And mind you, the masses of our people in this country don't pay tax. Not income tax, not VAT. They are just beneficiaries of our government which collects from the elite. Largely white people, of course, who inherited from colonialism and apartheid, but also a big chunk of the Indians and some foreigners who pay a lot of tax for the benefit of the black masses. I must then somehow put those people first. And my thing is now, I'm making a conscious decision that I will be my own country. I will be the country of Penwell. And I will have people around me, my circle of Penwellists. And we will be our own nation. And are we going to judge whether someone is a foreigner to us? Whether legal or illegal, that doesn't matter. Those are legal terms. We're going to judge a foreigner as someone who doesn't invest in what we do, someone who doesn't buy from us, someone who doesn't work for us, someone who doesn't add value in our lives constructively. Then you are a foreigner. I don't care for your nationality, your gender, your race. If you are not adding value to my life and the life of my circle, you are a foreigner to me. So the concept of illegal foreigners doesn't matter to me because I don't care about the borders I don't care about your ID. I don't care about your passport. What I care about is, are you a good human being in my life? Are you committing crimes and raping and killing and stealing from other people? Specifically myself. If you're adding value to me, I do not care. And where possible, I might even find a way to help protect you. 
from the laws of this country, as an example. And I think this is going to be a very con important concept for myself, for my panelists, and for other people who are going to follow us. Because it might inform how you start seeing how these moves work. If you live in a neighborhood where there are undesirable people there, committing crimes, stealing your resources, whatever the case may be, get rid of them. If they happen to be South African from somewhere else, it doesn't matter. Those are bad people in your space. Get rid of them. It's really as simple as that. If you've got a Pakistani, Somalian, Ethiopian, Bangladeshi, a European, American, Chinese person in your neighborhood who's adding value, teaching you guys how to farm, bringing amazing tools, giving you guys Wi-Fi, helping you guys export to other nations, that's a good person. To then go and ask them, do you have a passport? Did you get into this country legally or illegally? If you're not getting paid for it, and if it fundamentally does not affect your life in a negative way, that's where I stand. I'm going to stop there to end this video. I'll chat to you guys very soon. I love you guys. Hope you're having a great day. And don't forget to work really, really hard. Penal is God. Penalism is the answer. I look forward to building with you. Remember, remember to send an email to join our database. Penalist at gmail.com. P-E-N-U-E-L-I-S-T at gmail.com with your name, your surname, your location. And let's build this database. Let's help fundraise. And let's build a very strong community of penalists that can mimic the Jews, the Muslims, and the white Afrikaners in this nation so that we can also win. Unlike those groups, obviously, we're going to have our own value system. Have a great day. Cheers.